Please welcome to the stage, Sarah Williams. Hi, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I am actually, this is one of my reunions. This is my 10th reunion. Do we have any 05s here? Do you want? Yay? <laughs> OK. Um, um, so I want to talk to you today um, about the rise of big data. And we've heard that the, the big data is really going to change the world that we live in. But I believe big data will not change the world unless it's collected and synthesized into tools that have a public benefit. Um, and this really goes back to what uh, the president was talking about earlier, is how do we use data for a public good? Um, I run something called the Civic Data Design Lab. And our lab uses data, um, so it's kind of spreadsheets that look something like this. And we transform it into images that can affect and expose policy. So this particular map that we're looking at looked at how much it costs to incarcerate people in, uh, in this neighborhood in Brownsville. And those red blocks show it costs over a million dollars to incarcerate people from those blocks. And the idea here was to talk about how we could spend some of that money on re-entry programs that are the systemic reasons that people are going into prison in these communities. These maps actually wound up being used uh, in Congress for the Criminal Justice Reinvestment Act of 2010, which allocated funding to reentry programs um, across the US. Um, and one of the things that we're really interested in the lab, and this is actually, a, I should mention, a collaboration of a colleague of mine um, at Columbia University, Laura Kurgan. Um, but one of the things that we're really interested in is thinking about how we can get these issues to broader publics by using communication as a strategy. And so these maps actually are currently on view in the Museum of Modern Art. And we hope it brings it to a, a much greater public. Um, so really, I think data is the new infrastructure. And if it's a new infrastructure in the same way that water pipes were the infrastructure in the turn of the century, um, we need to be thinking about the greater good. And so what I want to do is talk about two uh, projects that I have going on in the lab that really try to use data in this way. Um, I also want to, before I do that, talk a little bit about three areas that I really think we need to discuss in terms of data. If um, we have more open data, we need to have more data literate people, a more data literate society. So open data means we have more access to it, and we need people who are skilled in analyzing, collecting, visualiz and visualizing it. And um, that's one of the uh, things that I strive to do as part of the lab. I also think that we need to call for new data visualization and collection tools in order for the public to own the stories that they tell about their communities. Accessible tools need to be developed to allow them to easily collect and visualize that data. And then thirdly, I think if mostly the majority of the data that's now owned in the world is privately owned, we need to think about how to access and use private data for a public good. I'm going to focus on number two here um, in kind of the things that I do in my research and really the development of data tools for policy development. And I think that we have the ability to create tools that allow citizens to tell the stories about the places they live. And so one of these stories is Digital Matatus. And this is a project that I worked on. Uh, with the University of Nairobi, Columbia University, my research lab, a local technology firm in Nairobi, and the Rockefeller Foundation. And this project started many years ago. I've been working in Nairobi for some time, thinking about congestion patterns. And um, many developing cities, rapidly developing cities, are experiencing severe congestion problems. And this is a typical scene in Nairobi. Um, and one of the things that I've been tasked to do is create transportation models for the city to think about new flows, new transportation access. 
Um, this is actually, we created one of the first GIS data sets for Nairobi, which actually allowed us to model the flows into the city. Um, and that was done along with creating uh, different land use patterns. This is looking at the density in Nairobi. Actually, you can see these very uh, bright green spots are um, uh, some of the informal developments in the city. But one of the things, um, as I was making these models that was problematic is we didn't have information on the bus system. And these are the matatus, which are these small vans and vehicles that you see here. And they actually, um, 3.5 million people depend on the matatus. They make up the majority of the cars on the roadways. Yeah, we had no information for the us for our model. So we, um, just to give you, I want to give you an idea of what a matatu is like. It's, it's often hard to conceptualize, so let's just Till look I at this video. Boring, but I just yeah, if you wouldn't know better, you could be in a club or a bar, but you're not. You're in a minibus driving through Nairobi. And with volumes like this, you'd better not come on an empty stomach. On the outside, they're painted in hot designs. And their name Matatu is derived from the Kiswahili words for three cents for a ride, which nowadays is more like 30 cents. The fares are raised by the conductors. <laughs> Traveling by Matatu is a daily reality for millions of Kenyans. Um, so Matatus are uh, clearly the uh, topic of conversation. Some Matatus even have disco balls in them. They're competitive. Um, they're, they're just like uh, uh, their topic of conversation as we talk about our subway or metro systems. Ni people in Nairobi talk about the Matatus. And, um, but the Matatu system is hard to navigate because um, people don't actually have a map and didn't have a map at the time of where they go. And also one of the things uh, with a matatu is that to get a matatu, you simply go to um, City Hall, register, and then you go to a sign, uh, uh, a sign uh, creator, like this person in Cabrera who makes your sign for number eight and puts it in the vehicle. As we try to make this data, we went to the city council file, and this is how they had registered the matatus. And you see, it's a list of about 30. We know there's 130 matatus, so there was clearly not enough information about where they were. Um, so we wanted to create raw data for our model, but we wanted to create data that people in Nairobi could use. Then we wanted to create a map to allow them to navigate their city. And one of the things we realized is cell phones are really highly used in Nairobi. And just to give you an example of that, um, M-Pesa is a system that's used there. And M-Pesa is like how we use our credit cards. But people use M-Pesa in Nairobi to transfer minutes. Um, and so you can buy a cup of coffee by sending people cell phone minutes. So we thought, how could we leverage the ubiquitous nature of cell phones in Nairobi, Kenya, to capture data about the informal transit system, which most citizens depend upon, and open that data up for anyone to build upon and use. So we developed an app which allowed us to crowdsource the information about where all the matatus went. And uh, we collected that data in a format called GTFS. How many people know what GTFS is? One person, that's amazing. It's usually nobody. Actually, you uh, use GTFS. Most of you probably used it this morning to navigate here to the MIT campus, or maybe not. Um, when you're in Google Maps, you use the back end that allows you to figure out the transport options uses GTFS. So we decided to collect that natively so that we could have routing systems built on top of our data. So what I'm going to do is give you an example of what that looks like. So GTFS data is actually a text file that has latitude and longitude information. And as you build the text file, it begins to uh, build the road. So what you're seeing now is actually um, our uh, University of Nairobi students collecting data and actually drawing the roadway maps in Nairobi itself. 
One of the things that we did, and I'm going to skip ahead a little bit in this video, is actually find designated and undesignated stops, which were really important for um, planning purposes for the city. But as I mentioned earlier, one of the things that we were really interested in doing was thinking about how we could create a map for everyone of this complex system. And one of the things is, is that many of the Matatus follow a similar route. And so we began to kind of group the different routes into segments um, along a roadway and create quarters. Um, as we began to create those quarters, we created a legend that went with the map. Um, but we realized that this was still really hard to understand. Look, it looks like a mess of points. So what we did is actually lay a grid on top of it and begin to stylize the map. And we stylized it in a way that you would see a New York City subway map, a Paris map, or even the Boston uh, subway map. And we began to add points of interest to the map, um, uh, places, uh, subway stops, routing names. And ultimately, um, we're able to develop a map that everybody could use. And we um, edited the map with Matatu drivers. And what you're seeing here is actually instantly the map being used for planning purposes. They could see a lack of Matatus in the northern area of the city. And um, as being able to visualize this data allowed them to think about lack of service and be able to start to plan for that service in Nairobi itself. Um, and so one of the things that was interesting is this, as we edited the map, and we actually released uh, this map um, here, we also held a hackathon. And we did that with the local technology community in Nairobi. And from that hackathon, we actually developed two apps, one which is called Sonar, which is a routing app that's used on Nairobi cell phones. So now anybody in Nairobi can find their way around Matatus using this app. There's also another app called Mothri Route, which actually allows you to route yourself through Nairobi, but also hear about traffic accidents along the way um, so that you can divert your route. But I think one of the most exciting moments about this project was when the Nairobi government held a press conference to release this map as the official map of the city. Um, and I think what, what was really interesting about that is, you know, for the large part, we had done this project on our own. We had incorporated the government. They seemed largely disinterested. But once they could see the map and the possible public benefit it could have for them, they took ownership of the map itself. And you can see here um, them at the press conference. Um, and actually, this is them giving it to the county government um, as, as a, a kind of official release. And the maps went viral on the internet. Um, they were uh, distributed in newspapers, um, and they were um, uh, downloaded. We've had um, over 10,000 downloads of the maps itself, um, the larger maps um, on the internet since it, it's um, been released. So really, it's showing the power of the data. Um, this data is uh, you know, now navigable. You can find your route on the computer, but you also have access it, to it through visualization. All right. I'm going to switch gears to a totally different region. And um, this region is actually in midtown Manhattan. And this is a project I worked on where um, in 2010, the city wanted to rezone the Garment Center. And the Garment Center is a manufacturing district that's right in the middle of midtown Manhattan. And one of the things that you could see is um, it's right between the bus terminal, the train station, and thousands of subway lines. And right now, the garment district has protected zoning. So that means rents are protected. They're about $16 per square foot, where in that area, rents go for much, much higher. Um, and so um, 
The Garment Center is really still a production of the uh, industry for the apparel industry. Um, you see fabric stores. These are the types of manufacturers that you see in the, the garment district. And fashion is really produced here. Um, and when this zoning went underway, the, the fashion designers argued that if you remove the protective zoning, it's going to ruin the industry. It's the proximity that matters. It's the protective zoning of this industry that's really important. Um, and they say it's kind of this inter-network of wholesalers, suppliers, um, retailers that makes the district work. But at the same time, the city's saying, Apparel manufacturing has declined 81.5% since 1980, and that's the same in New York City. And so there's an 80% decline in the manufacturers in that region. But actually, when you look at the decline in New York City, one of the things that you're seeing is that the industry is shrinking to its core. So it's shrinking to the garment center here in the Lower East Side, where there are protective zoning measures for the industry itself. Um, and in fact, 79% of apparel industry is in and around the garment center for the whole New York City metro region. Um, and when you look at the garment center, these are all the fashion-related businesses. And so they look as long as they hug on Broadway here. And so the question was, the city wanted to remove sections of the district. But the argument was from the fashion designers that it's this industry in motion. So we decided to track fashion designers um, for a two-week period using social media. They checked into everywhere they went. So we had over 100 fashion designers from large, small, and mid-level design firms that checked in um, and actually wanted to see how they use the district. And this is just a quick video um, that helps you see how they're moving through the garment center over this two-week period. We had very large people along the lines of Calvin Klein to very small stores, boutique uh, fashion designers that we tracked. And so one of the things that you can see is that many of the trips go into the garment center. Um, we actually found 85% of all fashion-related trips go into the garment center itself. Um, but one of the things um, that we were able to do is find out that really the benefit of the garment district as an agglomeration. So this is a particular trip that a designer made. They went to Venue, which is a bead store. New York Beads, Fun to Beads, Tahoe Shoho, which is a bead store. Uh, Myers Imports that sells beads. Um, and then Q Extra Made that sells beads. So one of the things that people argue in the um, agglomeration economy is it's the proximity really matters. Clearly, this fashion designer left their studio, went looking for beads, and came back. And they were actually able to have that just-in-time economy to the work. The other thing that we were able to do is figure out where the actual businesses that the fashion designers visited. And so one of the arguments all along during this rezoning process is that the city wanted to rezone this area, because if you remember, the previous map looked like all the businesses hugged Broadway. But actually, the businesses that the designers were using, and they argued before this study that were along 8th Avenue. And actually, that's what we can see. And actually, yellow is the manufacturing businesses. So what we were ab actually able to do is identify that those businesses in the 8th Avenue quarter were being used more. The other really interesting thing that we were able to figure out is why are these businesses marked as manufacturing? We found out that a lot of different kinds of businesses, such as architecture firms and so forth, were getting manufacturing credit, but they weren't actually ma manufacturing businesses. So it was helpful to identify that. And here's that previous map, as I mentioned, which looked like a lot of the fashion-related businesses were hugging Broadway. So we were able to figure out that both people inside and outside the garment district are benefiting. They spend about the same amount of time on trips. But they also, um, people in the district can make nine trips. People outside can make four trips because they can get the benefit of the agglomeration and chain their trips. 
We were also able to identify that large and mid-level design firms were using the district more than small firms. And why is this important? This is because fashion design is big business in New York. It brings about $31 billion into the city in a year. And if we move the district, it actually was going to be affecting the larger firms than the smaller firms, which had been previously thought. Um, but one of the things that's really interesting about this study is that we were actually able to shelve the zoning in the garment district. And what happened is actually they decided to keep the manufacturers that are in, there in place, as, as well as the wholesale and display stores, but then actually open up different floors to new types of businesses and operations. And so they created a much more articulated zoning based on our data. So um, one of the things that I'm really interested in is how can we affect policy with data? And this is a particular example where we use two different tools um, to really show and expose kind of underlying systematic patterns. Thank you very much. <laughs>